The Gogodala tribe, numbering some 6,000 people, inhabits the floodplain of the Aramea River, north of the Fly River Delta in western Papua. Most of the area is low-lying and for nine months of the year inundated with water. The extensive swamps and lagoons are studded with many islands and surrounded by high grass-covered ridges. It is on these that the Gogodala build their villages and make gardens. An early explorer in the 1920s made the following observation. The gardens are unique among Papuan gardens in the attempt at planning and genuine horticulture. Their community is one of extraordinary beauty, marred only by the presence of mosquitoes which arise from the vast swamps at sundown with the noise of a distant surf. Being essentially swamp dwellers, the canoe is of vital importance to the Gogodala and is honoured in the traditions and customs of the tribe. Close to the site of the original Gogodala settlement is the township of Balamo, the government administrative centre, hospital and mission station. Traditionally, the Gogodala village consisted of a single communal longhouse. Houses such as this last remaining example at Isago were once common to all 27 Gogodala villages. Accommodating upwards of 500 people, they sometimes reached 200 metres in length by 25 metres in width. They consisted of a sago thatch roof extending to the ground on either side of a raised platform. The centre of the platform, extending the full length of the structure, forms a hall which is entered by a small door at either end and is reserved exclusively for men. There are no windows. The only natural light filters down through cracks in the two small doors at either end. On either side of the hall are walled off three-storey apartments where women and children live. They enter from beneath the building. Though first contacted as early as 1900, it was not until the 1930s that an unevangelized field mission, encouraged and supported by the Australian Colonial Administration, established itself in the area. As the mission doctrine spread, many people became convinced that traditional values and custom were incompatible with their newly adopted Christian beliefs. Then, as in many other areas of the Pacific, mass burnings of all totemic carvings followed, major ceremonies and rituals ceased, the longhouses were allowed to decay, and along with them the highly developed forms of artistic expression and the rich intellectual involvement. And they give those Bible books to these big men, and these big men stop these things, and all of them they believe. And so they they left the, these carving things where that house house over there. They left those things there, and they, they came around here, and they built house here. And missing people came about and told this God's word to these Isaac people and they stop, they stop living this what evil st spirits and some other cabins, old cabins like that. The spiritual significance of canoes was paramount to the Gogodalo. Every year during the wet season, the canoe maker from each clan would build one or more large ceremonial canoes. 
Much care was lavished on their construction, the intricately carved prows and the clan designs painted on the sides with coloured pigments. For the highly skilled carver and his assistants, it was a period of continence. Food was gathered and brought to them by male relatives, the women being forbidden to look at the canoes or the men at work. The canoes were launched amidst elaborate feasting and ritual dance, having been guarded the previous night by elder clansmen to see whether or not a ghost appeared nearby, an ill omen for the canoe. After periods of internecine warfare, usually resulting from land disputes or arguments over women, protagonist clans would hold a canoe race. The victors of the race, having thus formally demonstrated their strength, established their claims and rights in the disputed area. In an act of faith aimed at breaking the power of the ancestors and clan solidarity, early mission converts often deliberately chopped off the carved canoe prow, the clan emblem. For everyday use, transport and fishing dugouts without ornamentation are used, primarily by the women. According to Gogodala mythology, the clan ancestors arrived from the south in eight large canoes, the primary totem of each clan. In recent years, there has been a revival of canoe prow carving, hull decoration and related spiritual activity. Associated with warfare, canoe festivals are still held, usually on public holidays, with one or more villagers racing against one another purely for the prestige and honour which victory brings the clan. Should a canoe win several races or suffer damage, it is laid to rest in the village square. At Kamama village, people of the Sargela tribe gathered to commemorate their canoe, Medula Bali, which won a race against the people of Kala village in 1973. Gogodala society consists of two sub-tribes, Sargela, the red people, and Paya, the white people. Each sub-tribe is further divided into four totemic clans, which further subdivide into ten or more sub-clans. The clans are exogenous, a moiety of each clan living together in a village, forming a local group. Children belong to the clan of their father. Being a patrilineal descent system, they show their appreciation of the canoe and the prestige it brought them, by distributing gifts of food and coconuts to their mothers, the Paya people.
this instance, incest taboos were broken and the canoe smashed as a token of conciliation with the clan ancestors. This ritual destruction also releases the canoe spirit, which, though normally benevolent, is liable to become frustrated and malignant, a possible source of trouble in the village if left trapped in the canoe too long. Mark's got another drum of dieseline fever for you to use. If you want, that makes four drums you've got. But still keep the power cut down on the hours, all right? Except if the hospital wants it. Truck deck and I do have it here. Yeah, that's about all, I think. Dibur Taya Lao, Lao Garuma Dek Nai. Dini Ibon, I go Taya Lao. There's also one trouble at um, Awaba. One girl had a fight up there with one of the teachers, so I'll have to send her down to you. Which one of you want to go with Clement? You do. The uh, rest of you, you and Ito better stay here. One can go with Clement. I don't think we can take one up the river because we leave no one here to look after this place. If we had more policemen, we could all go up and try the policemen hide. Okay. Next one. come down here into the Gogodara about uh, 47, 48. In those days, uh, Siwasi in particular had quite a big long house and uh, further down the river there were quite a lot of others and uh, so the missions had organised it in such a way that they'd created their own sabi or law as it is and uh, their law stated that uh, the actual uh, culture of the people, uh, which might to do a lot with sex, and being as pious as they were, they uh, thought this was pretty nasty. So uh, they organised in such a way that they had uh, pastors uh, at the people all the time to do away with their original culture. Uh, quite a lot of the good artefacts were uh, got by some of the uh, early crocodile shooters and traders around the place. Uh, most of the stuff is finished up in the uh, museum now, I believe. But uh, all in all, the Mission Sabi, uh, or law as it is, that uh, uh, created this uh, lack of uh, uh, interest in the young people to, uh, to carve. I don't want to get the idea that I'm uh, terribly against the missions. I mean, uh, quite a few missions have done some good work. 
And this particular mission here has uh, done quite good work in the medical field. Uh, but they haven't uh, bothered much with uh, the practical side of uh, teaching or, or uh, all in all they've taken from the people everything they, uh, they were interested in and uh, left them with next to nothing. But as I say, I uh, don't want to get the idea that I'm firmly against them, but it uh, seems to be a hell of a waste of time, both by the uh, mission people uh, wasting their time and uh, uh, wasting the people's time in uh, taking away from them uh, anything they may have had in the way of culture and uh, giving them nothing but a, a, a religion which is totally foreign to them. And um, this year, this is my last year. I'm going to complete my education in secondary school. And I'll be going away at the end of this year. I'm going to go to high school. I'm going to go to high school. I'm going to go to and I'm very happy that we are here to preach God's word, to help the people to know about Jesus Christ. And I'm very glad that I'm standing in front of you and I know that Lord Jesus is in me and I'm very, very glad that he dwells in me. His Holy Spirit is in me. Trust in my Lord as I walk on. I just keep trusting my Lord and he gives me a song. Now the storm clouds darken the sky of the heavenly trail. I just keep trusting my Lord he will never fail. I can count on Jesus to the very end. Though the storm clouds stuck in the When I first visited the villages of the Aramea floodplain, I found the people in a state of cultural stagnation. A group that before mission and government influence had been a flourishing society with a high level of artistic creativity. Amongst 6,000 Gogodala, all I could find was the one six-foot ceremonial drum at Kala village. A drum that was used in the sacred Ida Mayata, a ceremony to appease an ancestral hero.
but to the church it was purely idol worship, and this is why all pieces associated with Ida were burnt. They were taught that their flamboyant clam patterns were the eyes of evil spirits, and they were not to associate themselves with such spirits other than that of the Lord. At Isago village, the men identified my photographs of cultural material that had been collected in the early 1900s, but I was told they were not permitted to carve such pieces, otherwise, I quote, we will forget about God. I can remember an occasion when I met a missionary on the roadside, and I started a conversation regarding the Gogodala clam patterns. He claimed that the, that the kids would doodle on their test papers by drawing their patterns, and this was wrong. The people must not associate themselves with carving, etc., he said, otherwise the attendance in church would drop, and this was no good. Anyhow, I started to visit the villages upriver and would hold meetings with the old men discussing the purpose of a culture, the meaning and purpose of history, the result of no culture, and that we needed to revive their art style, their legends, dancing, etc., for the benefit of the younger generation. And it was here that the old men appreciated what I was trying to do for the people. I can remember one old man, after listening to some of my earlier recordings of the Ida ceremony, he said, we are like a post, we are like a teamy, we have nothing. Now this is a teamy, and there used to be two of these for every longhouse, the center joist post. And he said, we are like a plain teamy. We have no culture, we have no color, we have no dancing. We should have it. Why can't we have it? At that stage, young Beggy, a fine artist, in fact, he was the first man to bring a carving to me. He said, well, why don't we build a longhouse? I thought, Struth, that, that is a mammoth job. It was at that stage that the National Cultural Council was formed. So I submitted a detailed plan to the NCC, plans of the construction and a summary of the necessary costs and we were granted some $7,000. So in October 70, 73, we actually started construction. And we had anything up to, at one stage, 80 men at a time in the bush collecting material. Posts, joists, black palm, sago for the roof. Of course, to build this house was no easy task. For six months, we had many problems. We had land disputes, week after week. A young man would come to us and say, you must stop collecting timber from my land. Yet we knew from the old men, like Saliki, that we were collecting timber from his land and his father's land. However, this young man had created a land dispute, which meant that we had to stop. So we had to go to another locality. Within one week, two weeks, the same thing. Another land dispute, another, another. After a while, we woke up. We found out that these people coming up to us complaining were all pastors and deacons of the church. So we feel that this was just perhaps organized resentment against the construction of the longhouse. By 74, early 74, the construction was completed. 120 feet long by some 80 feet wide. The first longhouse to be built for some 40 years. The longhouse was officially opened as a cultural centre by the Prime Minister, Michael Samari, in August 1974. Despite continued opposition from some mission people, many elders from the surrounding villages began using the longhouse regularly as a place to practice and relearn the art of carving, exchange stories, practice dance and teach the young Gogodalas their clan history. Mia, we are about to watch Yamuroi. 
Ali Miro Bini, Vojtka nam je to rema. Kada je pa mala... Obate, opet mojir je nemijena. E nemijete... Vana napa bigja, napi tija, napi bigja nemijena. E nemijete, tao duni. Duni tao egen. Ege tema, tao reći ti pindat peve. Ti pindat peve, te gi gujarama, paka mi. Mama atpa napi tim ro, paka mi. Bonnie, tell me in big way. Bonnie, tell me in big way. Mire, mire, pack me in oh. Mire, mire, pack me in oh. Oh, pack me in oh. Oh, pack me in oh. Can they pack me in? Timi, ma'am, te pa na pa timi to de te. Wama, goro pa na pa to de. Ta ona pa to de. Wau yad na pa te. Karam yad na pa te. To ro te gi gu er magu. Boi gi gi mina hi yo. Me ne pi la mo te ni. Can they pack me in? Can they see di bega doro ro yano? Eni mi te mi in te pa. Go up a poor. Rumor men happy to sell out domine, bow domine. All the gourmet Saudi in room. Happy to have more yummy room. Tessera domine there and demean a seg, cocoa, dart or tad, dart. Cut big up a wheat, a pat, a brother for an arco crack of me. Happy to say, what you cut a pass in for Tayara? When the first missionaries came, they um, sort of got in new recruits to be um, pastors and they trained them. Some of them, when they became pastors, looked back into what they used to do before they were pastors. And then one of them had the idea that it was bad for our people to practice the uh, traditions they used to do, especially in the dance. they do the Aida dance and the others as well. There's a dance where when people are dancing and the men are dancing around in the um, sort of like a circle, sort of a semicircle type. And then the ladies come around, the men, and dance around. And they sort of, when the ladies come around, they pull the ladies into the center. And then probably they have sex with the uh, ladies and this to the missionaries was bad and the pastor said well if we continue doing this the people won't really believe what we are saying so the rule wasn't really made by the missionaries but it was our own pastors who felt that we shouldn't continue on with these things so from then on our culture started dying times in biblical history there has always been a decision that people have had to make concerning their life in connection with Christian living. The Israelites had to decide whether they would follow the God who chose them 
or accept another way of life. And right down through history, this has been the choice that people have made who have heard the Christian message, the choice of following Christ in the church or rejecting Christ and following another way of life. The Gugadala people have in the past years accepted very readily the message of Jesus Christ. And many of them have accepted the whole of the challenge that Jesus Christ gave and have been completely committed to following this way of life. Our Lord, when he spoke in his earthly life said that the cross of Christ or the Christian life came and would bring division in many different areas and perhaps this is one of the areas that has affected the Gugadala people in that in choosing the message that the missionaries brought in the early years they found it necessary either to accept or to reject certain areas of their culture which conflicted with their belief in the Christian life. And so there were some areas that the people felt they could not accept as being part of a Christian's life. It would seem that in accepting a total commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ, these men and others who have passed on have felt that they could no longer continue in some of their pre-Christian era um, ways of living. And so the recent revival that has uh, come in amongst the Gorgodalas in the renewing of some of their dances, their paintings, these are areas where Many of the Christians have had to say, well, we're sorry, but we haven't been able to participate in these because they conflict with our belief in the Christian life. And this is a message that we have taught and preached through God's word. It's not our own message, it's God's message. And we have taught this in the church, leaving the responsibility to the person themselves. this is a bad thing and some people they came stop us they said uh, oh, this is long time we left this 
why you people or why you like to bring this up again. This make us um, or gives us bad way. And I told uh, some people that is not bad thing. This is good thing for people to use or get some money uh, from that cabin. When the um, Gogodala Council uh, uh, Cultural Center was first built, and they were, <coughs> the people sort of had different sort of ideas to why they were building it. And so every time when they brought in things, they expected something in return for it. And to my point of view, I think if the people are told or taught that it is not only for business that we want the culture center to be, but also for the preservation. That is, if we have people who make things, artifacts, not for money, not for business, but just so that people can learn, if they can put them in there, and then the younger ones, after the ones who've made them have died, then the ones who come after. They can get in there and look and see that belongs to their clan, that belongs to their tribe. Then they will know that we have culture, we have our traditions there. A legacy of Australian colonial tradition is show day. In an attempt to foster a sense of unity and cross-cultural awareness, tribes from outlying areas would be brought into an administrative centre, where, with the offer of cash prizes, sports and traditional dancing were organised into competitive events. An outcome of this was that often traditional costumes and forms of dance expression were exaggerated and transformed to catch and impress the eyes of the judges. In Balamo today, the tradition continues with several public holidays, namely New Year and Independence Day, being celebrated in the carnival atmosphere.
The cultural vacuum and general sense of creative frustration among the Gogodala, resulting from mission banning of traditional dance, was overcome by adopting the dance styles of the neighboring Kiwai tribes, which, outside their ritual context, were considered less offensive by the missionaries. Here, the people of Kimama village elaborate on a Kiwai theme. The opening of the cultural center has witnessed the re-emergence of some traditional Gogodala dance. synthesis of revived tradition and ideas from other provinces has resulted in a spectator orientated pop culture My name is uh, Abadi Sawasi, and I work for the Gouda Local Government Council. And uh, I would like to say a few things about the cultural life here in, uh, in the Gouda area. At the present time, there are groups of, uh, there are two groups in this area. Some are talking against the cultural life, and some are uh, 
talking about the culture of life being good. I blame both parties for not uh, th thinking clearly of uh, what the cultural life is about. There are many Christians who are saying that our oh, whole cultures, all way of worshiping is no good. But uh, they themselves too are not thinking well. I say this because those Christians who say the cultural is no good, they seem to be using the cultural life too. Like uh, placing their own uh, canoe designs and other things like uh, salagos, what we call uh, the flowers. So we cannot really say that uh, the cultural life is no good. Now, as I'm a Christian, I would like to say a few uh, things about this cultural life. I myself like to see a cultural revolution here happening in uh, the Gokodal area. I don't think the whole Gokodala cultural development has been stopped by the church itself, uh, by the missionaries, as most people say, even in the headquarters and uh, other parts of the main uh, centers. The Gogodal culture was stopped by a man called Hasiya. I mean, the dance, he did not stop the culture. He said the dance is no good, because as I've said, during the dance, there was adultery. During the dance, the women dance without clothes on. So this is why he stopped that part of the dance. And again, don't forget, during that time, Gogodal people were only interested in themselves. But during these days, you could see Gogodal people are mixed. They've got uh, people from outside. they got Motu people here in this Gogodal area. they got uh, Kerema people. they got Medan people. they got Sipiks. they got Robals, the Tolais. And among Gogodal people, you could see that they are intermarried. And their lives have been changed. So there's, we cannot really say that the missionaries have influenced the people to stop using these uh, old cultures. That's not true. When government brought in the law and order, it also influenced the people from uh, sticking on to their old ways of life. Because those things uh, that uh, old people have done were wrong according to the law and order. So the people were punished strictly. And from these days, many Educated people, even I, would like to see what has been happening in the past days. I like to see it come up again, but we cannot get all, all lot out, because the old men wouldn't tell all all of it to us. Because at the same time, we got some uh, educated men who got big heads, who will not always listen to the old people. Whatever they say, they might just laugh at them. So the chains that is taking place here in is not from one source. These days we are not fighting because government is here. The law is with the people. And also we find that Kamuras have come down. They have made their settlement at Bamustu, Makapa, and Pikiwa, and was there. So those people whom we once fought, whom our big people, our old men once fought, they are not fighting with them again. Now about this longhouse, I'm very happy to see this longhouse being built because it also reminds us of what our old people have been doing. I could see some designs that I've never seen before. I could see my own design, which I'm very proud of. And I could see my own wife's design, my mother's design, my grandmother's design. And this is very good. And I hope it will uh, be appreciated by the people same as I, and uh, I like to see this longhouse being maintained all the time with this uh, type of old cultural designs and uh, other activities. And if you got some uh, chance to have a old way of dancing, we can dance. And it's very good to see because it will help us, the young people, to learn what has happened in the past days.
So the building of this longhouse is a great help to our, own, uh, our new society, the new generation that is coming up. For the longhouse to realize its full potential as a resource center for the living arts in the Gogodala area, it is essential that its economic base be divorced from the demands of the ethnic art dealer and the occasional tourist. Only economic independence, either by diversified business activity or direct government grant, will enable the Longhouse the freedom to experiment and develop a meaningful program of cultural activity. The village people were very interested in making carvings until we ran out of money and we just get the carvings from the artists and just send them away to the shops. We sell them for them and pay them out. And the young men in Gogodalelia, they didn't like the way we were doing, so didn't like the didn't like to uh, make carvings and sell them to us. Same with the old men. Only few old men standing at the council center, doing few uh, carvings just working for nothing. And there is a mistake by many people to believe that culture means swaying of the hips and the grass skirts and the top of cloth and a dead piece of objects that lie still in museums. Now culture for Papua New Guinea surely means deep values that we cherish, values of cooperation, of interdependence, of sharing value that we live in a life of total spiritual beings. And I would like to remind people, governments of the world, that are concerned with our culture, that they have an obligation and a responsibility, the Eastern powers and the Western powers, to ensure that they respect our cultural autonomy no matter how simple we are, that they respect that we are Melanesians with our own cultural identity.